All right. Well, guys, thanks for joining us this morning. We have been honored to have Aaron Green come give you guys answer all your questions, all those burning questions you've always wanted answers to. And I know lately there's been lots of them with all the changes. So we're excited to have him here with us today. Thanks, Aaron. That's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So you guys got questions? Anybody want to start? I'll start. Thanks, Cordy. What is the best policy for agents wanting to do open houses for, for sale by owners with the new buyer's agency requirements? Like if they're doing it for the for sale by owner, they're not representing the seller, but they're also normally they would be looking for the buyers coming okay. in, but they don't want to have to get a form signed for everybody. So what do you recommend in that respect? Yeah, so again, the, the practice changes, there's kind of two triggers to having a uh, buyer uh, broker agreement. So you have to be working with a buyer. And then once you're working with a buyer, then you need to have one signed prior to touring a home. So I think this is very similar almost. I mean, when, when you're a listing agent and you're holding an open house, I think that's clear cut. You know, you're, you're you know, facilitating the interests of the seller only. Uh, so you're not working with any of these buyers until that happens. And I think this is a quasi analogous situation because if you're sitting in the open house and somebody walks in, you know, were you working with that buyer? You know, the answer is no, you never met them. You don't know them. You don't know their names. You've not had any discussions. So I don't think you're working with the buyer when they start looking at the house. Um, now, again, just like in the listing broker situation, if they start asking you questions, you know, hey, I am unrepresented. Hey, I am looking for representation. It, you know, would you consider working with me? You know, at that point, circumstances are probably working with the buyer at that point. And then again, it would be triggered prior to touring a home. So, I think that's probably the right answer. Um, again, these are MLS um, rules and ultimately they're enforced by your MLS. So if you're in the greater Phoenix area, uh, AR MLS, you might wanna ask them and see what their uh, stance is on it because ultimately the fine will come from them. Um, but again, the, the triggers are working with the buyer and then prior to touring. Perfect, thank you very much. So does that mean that you have a buyer coming in to look at the house? You've got to ask all these questions before you can even let them through the house? No. No, it's, again, if you're not working with that buyer, so that, you know, Mrs. Jones walks into the open house. You don't know Mrs. Jones. You don't know her name. You've never spoken to her. Um, you're clearly not working with Mrs. Jones. So for them to walk into the house, I don't think there's any trigger to have anything. Like I said, once you start talking to them, if it looks like they are looking for representation and you're wanting to represent them and you're starting to have conversations where you're going to be representing them, you know, or even if you were just prospecting with them and you're gonna, uh, you know, provide them some other listings uh, or, you know, they're, they're saying things like, hey, would you represent me in buying this house? Or I'm just saying, if, if discussions start happening where you are now working with the buyer, you know, then you must have an agreement before touring a home. So any, any new home. Any future home. Any future home. And that but that home's okay. I'm, I'm sorry? we need that and make sure that they sign once we start talking with them to look at future homes. But as far as this home, it, the time frame's okay that we didn't need it signed before then. That's, I right. understood that. Okay, good. I would think so. And again, I would double check with ARMLS that their interpretation yeah. is the same. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is it could still be the same subject property. So I like examples. So let's say you're talking to Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Jones is, oh my goodness, yeah, we don't have an agent. Um, we're first time home buyers. We love this house. Would you consider representing us? And you say, yeah, you know, I, I would love to do that. And then Mrs. Jones leaves and she wants to come back with her husband. Well, now you're working with Mrs. Jones 
And now prior to her touring another home, and it could be the same subject property, I think that then would trigger the need to have a representation agreement. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Of course. Hey there, like when, oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, to me, it sounds like when you establish the agency. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not just agency because because keep in mind agency in Arizona, you know, once you're you're representing somebody, you have a fiduciary duty to them to act in their best interests. Um, and I think it could be a prospect. I think there's a lot of members that, you know, are, are sending out drip campaigns. Um, and or sending them listings or, hey, a, a new house um, just came on the market in your area. You know, when you're having interactions with, with that buyer, um, and, and again, keep in mind the practice changes are from a settlement agreement uh, that are, are or, or should be, because again, it's all brand new, interpreted very, very broadly. So, I think working with, with a buyer, you don't have to necessarily have an agency relationship with them. Uh, they could just be a prospect. But once you're kind of doing activities um, as, um, you know, with a buyer, I think you're then working with them, even if you're, if they're not a client yet, they, they could be a customer and you could be working with a customer. Um, and again, if you are, then you would need a buyer agreement, a buyer broker agreement, you know, prior to touring a home. And touring a home, just to be very clear, is, is somebody physically at a property, at a property being toured, either the agent or the buyer, even if they're without you. If if one of you guys is is touring that property when you're working with the buyer. I think that's kind of what triggers the need for a buyer broker agreement. Hi, Aaron. I had a quick question. My name is Tammy Chapman. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering with the buyer broker agreement, I know a lot of times, obviously, we're establishing for our service our professional fee and discussing that, but there are cases when there's different commissions offered, not just with resale properties. That is relatively easy, I feel like, to navigate because you could just put a higher amount, like say 3%, which most of them nowadays are less, they're two and a half, and then you can just choose to do an addendum reducing that, right? But you don't want to cut yourself short and do a lower amount. But my question would be in the buyer broker, for example, in the additional terms, if you state resell professional fee is 3%, new construction professional fee 4%, just because a lot of times these builders are offering incentives. And instead of having to go back and constantly change it, I was told by another real estate attorney, as long as you're defining it within that guideline of that type of real estate, then it's okay. Um, but you can't say it could be this or it could be that. I mean, obviously, if, if it, you change it later, then you're going to have to do an addendum. But as long as you stated up front like that, it was okay. But I just wanted your opinion too. Sure. So let me say a couple of things. Number one is, is you're correct. And, and normally I'm the banana guy, but because it's just one brokerage, we can actually talk numbers, which is refreshing. Um, and again, what you choose to charge is up to you. Um, as you kind of point out, um, you can go down in compensation. You cannot go up. Right. Exactly. Because you have a, a buyer broker agreement at, you know, whatever, 3%. And, you know, the, the buyer or the, the seller is offering 4%. You know, having the buyer sign an addendum to pay you that extra 1% is problematic because you have a fiduciary duty to the buyer to act in their best interests. If you're not providing any additional services and you're already under contract, to perform these services at a certain amount, why would it be in the buyer's best interest to pay you more money that they would be receiving as a credit is, is just problematic. So again, um, yes, there's nothing wrong with you setting your compensation rate and uh, there's nothing wrong with you reducing it if you choose to do so. Um, I think something that we all understand and recognize is that in, in most um, 
uh, members representation agreements, you're getting paid for consummating a sale. So, you know, if, if you're providing services for a buyer for a year and they don't buy a house, you don't get paid. So if, if you're close to consummating a deal and, and you're willing to take a little bit less to make that happen, obviously it's in your interest to do so. So that does happen from time to time. As an association, we don't like that. Uh, we think you're, you're worth it, you know, every nickel that, that the buyer agrees to pay you. Um, but we get it, you know, and obviously it's your decision. As far as different amounts of compensation, um, it's not appropriate to have different compensation amounts based on what a seller is offering. Um, however, as you kind of point out, if you're, if you're negotiating two different compensation amounts for two different services, you know, exactly. I provide services for a resale and I want to get paid compensation of X and I'm going to provide a different service. I'm going to provide different services on a new build construction. Um, and I want to charge a different rate or um, uh, we're also looking for, for vacant lots. You know, if you're providing different services and you want to negotiate a different compensation amount uh, for the different services you're providing, um, that does not violate the, the practice changes. And okay. what we've recommended as an association is to use two different agreements. Okay. You would have one buyer broker agreement for, and you would just identify it. Uh, I'm just pulling one up here. You know, um, in the buyer broker exclusive employment agreement, um, again, it talks about locate property meeting the following general descriptions. So you might have one for, um, you know, again, there's a geographic area, there's residential land and commercial and other, you know, they might both say other, and it would say residential resale, residential new build. Um, we do have an FAQ. Uh, one of the things I've been touting is, is the Practice Changes website that we have. It has an FAQ where it talks about uh, this situation in regards to one is residential and one is the land, um, because those are two different services. We would recommend you use two different agreements check two different boxes, um, you know, combining them, it just, um, again, we think it's cleaner if, if it's just two different agreements and you're spelling out the services you're providing for each. Um, you know, as far as whether it's lawful or not, you know, I won't give an opinion on that. Obviously talk to your broker about what best practices, um, but just to, um, is everybody familiar with our, uh, the association's website, AAR online? Yes. Yeah. If you go to the main AAR online, our main website, the first thing that pops up huge, it takes up my whole screen is NAR settlement, best practice changes, click here. If you click there, you go to the best practices page and it's got all the sample forms and red lines. But if you go just below that, there's the latest training resources and there's two different rounds of FAQs that are, are really good and help kind of flush out some of these types of questions. Uh, we're gonna to continue to update those um, kind of as I get questions doing things like this. Um, you know, I'll start drafting additional FAQs. And again, we'll publish those in The Voice, which again, we send out to all of our members on Tuesdays. Uh, you can look for it there. And then again, we'll post it again uh, on our best practices web, web page. Um, and something else that's coming out that's been really good is uh, NAR has been coming out with a lot of resources um, of, of things about how to talk to buyers, how to talk to sellers, um, resources there. One of the new things that we just came out with um, is there's a uh, buyer agreement, buyer representation agreement flyer uh, that is generic and it's, it's meant to kind of give buyers um, you know, hey, what is a, a representation agreement and why are you asking me to sign one? So it just kind of has some bullet points in there. It's very um, uh, consumer friendly. It's, it's not, I didn't draft it. It's not all lawyer legalese stuff. <laughs> so, um, 
uh, but it's available. It should be, uh, to, I guess, no, there's 31 days. So on Friday, it will be in the forms library along with the buyer broker exclusive employment agreement and also the buyer broker agreement to show property forms. So it'll be available there, but there's a lot of, and again, we continually see try to update these um, with, with, again, information about questions and then also resources uh, that you can provide your, your clients, your customers to try to explain some of this stuff because again, it's kind of front and center nowadays. And, um, you know, everyone's been doing listing agreements for forever, but we're still trying to get used to, <laughs> to buyer uh, consultations and, and how to facilitate those discussions. So, th so there's some good resources there. Thank you. I had another quick question for you. Um, I know that dual agency is still legal here in Arizona, but every broker has a different way of handling that as to what they feel comfortable with within their agency. Um, what do you feel about dual agency? And do you see that like being eliminated at the end of this year? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? Because I mean, dual agency, obviously there's dual agency where there's two agents involved. And like, for example, Bliss is fine with that, but then one single agent, it's it's not something they want it to, you know, which understandably they're concerned that something's not going to be done proper or it's just more liability. But I just want to know what your what your opinion is on it. So yeah, and I'm taking a quick look, but my recollection is that, well, I know it's lawful in Arizona, and I think that's exactly. from statute, so I'm, I'm trying to find the statute real quick, um, but I can tell you this, if it's in statute, which I believe it is, and I'll double check it here, uh, I'll, I'll take another quick look, and I'll, I'll come back, and I'll, I'll call you if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's in statute. So if you were going to change that at the state level, uh, it would require legislation to go through the legislature and be signed by the governor. Um, our legislature currently is very evenly divided and a little bit of a mess. Um, and, and I don't think this election will change that. Uh, and trying to get anything passed is extremely difficult. I can tell you that the association would, would fight anything like that. And, and I don't think there's uh, a very uh, big chance that that would pass, uh, even without our involvement and with our involvement and, and the ability to kill bills um, is very, very good. Uh, so I don't anticipate that's gonna change anytime soon in Arizona. So I think that will continue to be lawful. Again, just because it's lawful doesn't mean that your broker allows it. So you always have to check with your broker and see what they allow and what they don't allow. Uh, we have you know, over 53,000 members, lots of brokerages. Uh, some don't allow it at all. Some allow it a uh, single broker. They don't care. Um, the only thing, and I, I, I think we've published some stuff on this that, that we do not recommend is, is having a conflict where you're the seller and you're also representing the buyer as that's a understandable. single agent, that's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> um, so we don't recommend that. We just think that's that's very bad practice. Um, but obviously speak to your broker um, and whether that's lawful or not is not clear. Uh, there's not like a specific statute that prohibits it. Um, there are lots of um, laws that that seem that that's not appropriate, but there's nothing been clearly gone up to the Court of Appeals where they've said Arizona law is violated when this happens. Uh, but again, we feel that's a very bad practice. Um, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, obviously with two agents, I think there's a lot less um, uh, possibility for conflict uh, as if it's a single agent. Um, but again, uh, both of those practices are lawful. However, uh, a number of brokerages have chosen not to allow one or both of those uh, lawful activities just for, for business reasons. Yeah, and I think it's it's difficult because like depending on how long you've been in it and knowing how to approach it, I, I've been doing it 21 years and knock on wood, I've never had any complaints with it. And, you know, in my career, I've probably done it 
maybe, you know, it's not very common, right? Maybe like 15 times ever. Um, but it's just having that fiduciary responsibility to be fair in both dealings. And then you can't advise, you know, hey, this is what you should offer to the buyer. They have to tell you what they're willing to offer. Um, I've always been taught, my understanding is you can provide comps and say, here are the comp ranges, what would you like to offer? But it, in the where we're at now, it's basically the dual agency is just allowed with two different agents within the same brokerage. But I just kind of wanted your opinion on that. I was just curious. So thank you for that. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Like I said, limited representation. There's always, anytime you're doing something that's not normal or standard, you know, there's more risk involved. It's more likely there's going to be a problem, more likely you're going to get sued. Um, and you, you have to make a business decision based on those factors. And as you kind of point out, um, the experience and skill of the, of, of the member, you know, makes a big difference uh, in those sort of situations. But Again, as an association, um, we advocate for you and, and, and give folks opportunities. And then for business decisions, you, you can choose to use those or not use those. And you know, just the same thing with our forms. No one's obligated to use them. Uh, we think obviously it's best practice, but um, we don't tell our members what to do. We don't tell our brokers what to do. Um, we advocate for you and, and we provide you hopefully the tools that will help you be successful. I had one more quick question. Um, do you see just because now, I mean, you know, change can always be difficult, but it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Um, and establishing your relationship, your professional relationship and, you know, what your services are worth up front is definitely not a bad thing. Um, I know for a lot of people was a lot of change. Mara, myself, I'm sure a lot of agents, we just kind of worked off the trust system. So it's been a little different for me. Um, I'll say doing this for so long, but I'm kind of wondering if another positive spinoff from it, and I haven't done this yet, but just wanted to see if you'd heard of more agents asking about this, or if you've seen it more often is even, you know, because we're kind of now educating the buyers more and setting more of a precedent of like, here's what our services are. Here's everything we're going to be doing for you. You know, this is what this agency relationship and this disagreement means through the, you know, buyer broker agreement. Um, and then have you had agents that are coming to you because there's so much more disclosure up front that are saying, hey, you know, we're professionals and, and there's a lot more legwork initially up front with the paperwork and we're setting a precedence of our professionalism. And you know what, I'm going to incorporate a, you know, you know, five hundred dollar um, uh, fee for an, for a retainer that is um, credited to you at successful close of escrow because there there is a lot of work that goes in this and people don't realize how time consuming it is for for us behind the scenes you know and everything we go through um, so it would be kind of nice I just don't know if because there's so much more disclosure going on and maybe people are like hey you know what let me set this precedent up front. I haven't tried it yet, but I would think if you say, hey, we'll reverse you at successful close of escrow that, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of curious if you've seen people asking you about that now or do you think they would balk at it? I mean, I know it's everybody's own personal business decision, but I just wanted your opinion on it. So, Sure. So the short answer is I've not heard anecdotally about it, if people are using it more or not. I can tell you that when we were drafting the forms in the work group, that was something that definitely came up and that's why the form was changed the way it is. So if you look at the buyer broker exclusive employment agreement, uh, there is an opportunity to have a retainer fee. And again, it's, it's a little click box and you put in the amount. And then there's also a click box of whether that fee will be, uh, will be or will not be credited against the end compensation. So again, you can- Exactly, that's why I was asking about it. Correct, yeah. so give options to our members. And, and again, we don't know. I mean, it was very difficult to try to predict the future of what may or may not happen. I've not really heard one way or another if that's being more utilized or not, but it was something that was important to the work group to have that, uh, something like that uh, available to, um, to our members. The other thing just to piggyback on, and, and I'm kind of curious, I always like to ask questions as well um, so I can gain information and, and knowledge. Um, I have heard some of the positive benefits, at least anecdotally for some members in that, um, you know, the requirement to have a buyer representation agreement early on um, has number one, 
kind of uh, separated real buyers from not so real buyers. Um, Absolutely. You know, somebody's, yeah, some like kind of looky loose. Hey, can you go show me this house? Well, yeah, but we need to sit down and we need to uh, have a consultation and you're going to have to commit to me. And they're like, oh, really? I'm just a neighbor. And I, I was just curious. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to look at the house. Um, so hopefully it's going to save us some time uh, that we're really only concentrating on our efforts on, on legitimate buyers and not people that maybe are not so serious. Um, I'm curious to see what you guys have, have experienced that or not. And the other thing too that I think is you kind of point out is, you know, before there was not really um, a commitment from the buyer. So, you know, having more discussions with them up front, um, hopefully is solidifying that relationship and that they're not going to be as apt to, you know, jump ship midway after you've been working with them for a month or, you know, you get to, to making an offer and then at the last minute, um, you know, the buyers, uh, neighbors, aunts, nieces, third cousins, uncle, you know, just got licensed also. Right. I'm going to go with them instead. <laughs> um, you know, so hopefully, and, and, you know, my wife is a buyer's agent, so I'm real sensitive to all this because I don't think, I think you're correct. I don't think buyers know that, you know, we have to hire babysitters and we have to pay for gas and we're exactly. driving you all over the place. And you, you know what I mean? So uh, them knowing that up front and getting their commitment up front is hopefully, you know, solidifying that relationship where they're not looking around and that they're legitimate buyers that are going to buy in the somewhat near future and not just taking a look and not just, you know, well, really, you know, we're in a one year lease. So we're a year out, but I was just kind of curious, you know, you can start setting that out without working, working and, and incurring expenses uh, before they get a little closer. So, so real quick, have, have you guys experienced any of that anecdotally? Do you, do you feel that you're um, maybe going to work a little less, hopefully for the same compensation? Yes, I've, I've experienced that so far, um, just because I know back when I used to do a lot of Zillow leads, even then it was one of the first things I would ask them. Um, a lot of times these buyers, sometimes they even know how it works. And a lot of times they don't, cause it's very confusing. They think they're talking to the listing agent and they're not, you know, fortunately a lot of that is changing at the end of this year, beginning of the year, but um, you know, it's one of those conversations where even as a Zillow premier rep, I would say, you know, are you working with some, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, you know, even before all of these changes took place and they would say, oh, well, yeah, but I just want to look at the home. And it's like, well, you know what, I'm not, you know, I don't just sit around for the fun of it showing properties just because, you know, um, and so I think it really has, at least I've noticed, started weeding out people where they're like, oh, well, you know, actually we already are working with somebody or, well, we were just in the area and we thought, so they were just like a looky-loo. They're not serious. So I've noticed it for sure. Good. Good. Yeah. I came into the business. I'm, so I've been in the business 33 years and I came in around the time that buyer's agency was just becoming a thing and people started talking about it and getting to know it. And it didn't take, but maybe two or three situations like you just discussed where I'd spent long weeks with people. And then they bought from their cousins, uncles, brothers, kind of that finally, I just said, I'm not doing this. Like, so I've been doing a buyer orientation with people from like 1990 on or 1992 awesome. on. And, so, and I won't take them out if they're not willing to sit down. I think it's personally a lot easier now, obviously, because we have Zoom, because I used to have to make them come into my office. And that was always the thing. And, you know, and so, but I've always just sort of done it. And to me, it's always just, I mean, you know, obviously, if it was a best friend or something, obviously, it would be a little different. But so to me, it hasn't been that big of a change. But um, as one of the coaches here, obviously, teaching people who've only been doing it, say, six months, and they haven't gotten into that habit, teaching them to start to have those conversations and getting into that habit. I do think it's saving them some time. I, I think so. a I'm little honest. bit of responsibility comes with it too, though. Like I've been telling them, like, if you're going to say to people, you're going to represent them, then that means more, in my opinion, than just sending them a few listings on the MLS every now and then. So if that means you have to go into a neighborhood and knock on doors to see if somebody wants to sell their house because you're trying to find them the right house, then you need to get your butt out there and do that. So that's kind of, you know, what I talk to them about, like, 
you know, we make a lot of money for what we do. And just because house values have gone up, we make more than we did five, 10 years ago. And so people have a right to expect more for that. And if that means you have to do what you have to do to find them a property, you're representing them. You need to get out and do that. So I think that's important as well. So, I mean, honoring whatever your, whatever you're saying your services are, <laughs> you obviously have to provide that. Uh, that that's right. a, a huge issue if you don't. And, and I agree with you. I mean, there's a lot of speculation about how this will all shake out. You know, will there be, you know, fewer, fewer agents, um, you know, providing better services? You know, nobody knows the answer to those questions, but um, right. I can tell you there's nothing, you know, and again, this is personal, you know, when my wife has been showing a buyer, you know, a house or houses for, you know, a year plus, you know, you gotta, you gotta close that sale, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? We got a lot invested in this, you know? Um, so again, if, if you can get more commitment up front, and again, I think set good expectations on both sides, um, you know, cause again, you know, you want to make sure that they're happy with your services. Um, the, the Department of Real Estate is very concerned about the practice changes. Um, they honestly think folks are going to sign exclusive agreements and then sit on the couch and just wait for the check to roll in because I get paid no matter what. Um, you know, I laugh at that because I, I know our members. I know we don't do that. Um, you know, but if, if we're, you know, setting good expectations, again, you know, um, I've got small kids in, in elementary school, you know, you can't call and expect to see a house in five minutes. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm available, sometimes I'm not, you know, setting up good expectations of, of what you expect and the services you provide and expecting to get paid for that. I don't think anyone has an issue with that to a degree. So, uh, for sure. hopefully, like I said, I, I tend to be a glass half full guy. So I'm like, great, we're just going to not be wasting our time with that and then we'll have more time to service better clients um and and uh, again hopefully make more money and have it be a, better, a positive benefit yeah and a lot of it is just the education process if you're educating them on the things like for instance you you're helping yourself not lose deals right so if they don't know that it's normal for a home inspection to come back with 65 items on it it doesn't mean the house is falling apart it just means right. someone's looked at it differently I tell them that up front in a buyer orientation so that when that happens, they're not freaking out and trying to bail out of the sale, right? They're, they've, ex they're expecting that to, to be the case. And, you know, it's just simple things like that, that I think makes it a little bit better to be able to really say that you're truly representing them. You're educating them on the process. No, 100%. I mean, the, you know, there's lots of studies that show this, you know, both buyers and sellers, um, they want representation. They want a professional to walk them through everything. They think it's it's money well spent. Uh, they want you to get paid, uh, despite what what all of our or some of our members seem to think that buyers just want, you know, free stuff and and will screw you over. That's not the case. Most buyers really recognize the value and they're they're happy to make sure you get paid. They just don't physically want to pay it out of pocket, <laughs> you know, right. which which makes perfect sense, and mm -hmm. and I don't anticipate that's going to change much. Um, but again, I, I think uh, people being terrified, uh, I think, was a little overblown. Hopefully, it wasn't as big of a deal. Clearly, it was already incorporating your business practice, so it didn't make a, a blip at all. But and I kept telling our members, you know, you meet with sellers all the time, you know, have listing agreements, uh, presentations. You know, they're the same people. The people that sell their house also go out and buy houses. You don't have to be afraid of, of buyers. They're not going to bite you. Um, it's the same, the same person, uh, you know, and it's just a matter of explaining a little bit, um, which again, if you've been doing that, you're way ahead of the curve. Uh, and folks, you know, hopefully by now have, have practiced their buyer representation presentations and, and have you know, done a couple and, and now hopefully it's sold out and we can all move forward and not have to uh, spend time trying to learn 20 new forms and, um, you know, fear of the unknown and everything else that goes with it. Aaron, I was going to ask your opinion on, 
on what you see. And I you can, obviously don't have a crystal ball to predict anything, but that'd be nice if we all did. Um, but, you know, just kind of what I see just from already the shift and what I'm experiencing is I am wondering if we're going to see a lot more buyers, obviously, because they don't understand that clearly as realtors, we're still you know, working together to keep the same standard. And we are educating our sellers and the value of providing a, you know, compensation, right? Because there's a lot of different pool of buyers that maybe, you know, th that demographic or just financially can't afford a down payment, closing costs and professional representation. So, you know, a good listing agent isn't just like, sure, what do you want to offer? Okay, 1%. Yeah, they can ultimately offer whatever they want. And you have to tell them it's your option to offer whatever rate you would want. But you know what, there's a lot of agents that just, or there's a lot of buyers that can't afford, um, you know, professional compensation. So if you're not offering anything, it's a little bit more challenging if they've instructed us not to show properties where they're not, where they have to come in and pay for their own representation. Right. And, um, I've already seen it. Like I'm on a, I'm on a team and, and I'm really excited. Sherry's actually on the call. She's, she's on my team now as well. And I had a listing, um, that just recently, it's in Mesa. It's a beautiful home. I actually had the buyer. He's um, He wrote like a little offer letter almost, right? He's like, this is what I would like to offer in this, this, this. And I explained that, you know, I'm representing the the seller, but that I said, I do have a team member who's a buyer's agent and, you know, she can represent you if you'd like. And he um, he elected to do that. So, you know, it, it worked out, right? Because obviously where I'm at, we don't do... Um, the dual representation with one agent. But I, I just feel like I see that trend where a lot of buyers are not necessarily maybe understanding and they're thinking like out the gate, they're going to now have to pay for a portion of it or maybe all of that fee to the buyer's agent. And so they're going to start trying to go more to the listing agent. And which to me, I think a lot of this is creating more of a problem than people realize because in the long run, I'm concerned that you know, even if you're like, no, you're unrepresented, right? And you sign off for that, um, there's going to be this implied agency anyway. So I don't know. I just kind of wanted to know your your opinion on that. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I actually am psychic and the uh, Powerball. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> 16. No. Um, yeah, I have no idea. And, and I think there was some speculation about that. I can tell you in the work group when we were developing these forms, uh, we definitely... Um, consider that as a possibility and wanted to be prepared for that. Um, so, so a couple things. Number one, on the new uh, residential listing contract, again, it was it was unbundled. So instead of having exactly. one amount and then sharing a portion of that uh, with a potential buyer agent, now it's just what is listing broker going to get paid? You know, what are we offering a buyer broker? There's also another option uh, to get paid or negotiate more money as a listing broker if the buyer is ultimately represented, unrepresented. So if you have buyers that are unrepresented, there are a number of our members that have expressed their concern that, hey, this is a lot more work, you know, because potentially implied agency you have to be very careful. Um, I need to, to try to assist the buyer to get to the closing table not because it's in the buyer's interest, but because it's in my seller's interest. You know, we're trying to sell their house. Um, and for that extra work and for that extra risk, I want to get paid more. So there's a spot to do that. Um, I'm not sure if folks are using that or not. Um, you know, yeah, it's definitely. So brand new, but, but that was one of the things to kind of uh, give an opportunity for the listing broker to explain this to the seller explain the benefits of, of having the buyer represented by somebody um, and, and that being part of the discussion of the listing uh, presentation. The other thing that we did too that hopefully you're aware of is there is an unrepresented buyer disclosure. Um, again, it is one of the new uh, you know 18 to 20 forms that came out August 1st. And uh, I, I think the worker did a really good job with it. I'm just kind of pulling it up here real quick. Um, you know, there's, you know, it's only one page. Again, we try to make it very consumer friendly. So a, a truly unrepresented buyer could hopefully understand it, you know, but it talks about representation that, Hey, I represent the seller and not you. 
Um, you know, I might communicate with you. I might provide you with transaction documents. I might conduct other activities to accomplish the sale of the property. However, all these activities are performed solely on behalf of the seller to facilitate the sale and not for your benefit. Uh, and this does not create an agency relationship. The other thing I like about it too is it talks about um, the fiduciary duties of the seller broker to the seller. And it specifically says them and in, in part of this is bolded. You know, the unrepresented buyer should not disclose any confidential information to me because I'm obligated to share with the seller. So don't tell me that you love the house and don't tell me that it's worth $600 million when the list price is only, you know, 300,000. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I love the fair dealings. Hey, we're going to deal fairly with you. Um, but uh, this does not include giving you advice on the steps you should be taking to protect your own interests. It does not include providing interpretation of contract terms or notification of deadlines. You know, this is, those are your responsibilities. So again, it's meant to be something that kind of explains to the buyer that them being unrepresented truly means that they're unrepresented and they need to protect their own interests and it's not up to you to do it. So hopefully that'll assist. Um, and then I had one more point and I think I forgot it. I think I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> that um, happens to all oh, of us. Yeah, but it's one of those things where, you know, I don't know. I think, I think buyers, um, you know, they don't know what's going on um, and they hear a lot of misinformation. And I think a lot of them think, hey, I am going to have to pay it out of pocket, so I, I can't do it. Uh, so I have to go unrepresented. And, and hopefully, and again, the association on your behalf is putting out uh, campaigns to the public uh, that we're going to be continuing next year. Uh, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on print and radio. Um, after the election, we might be doing uh, commercials, TV commercials as well. Or, or streaming stuff. Um, I know nothing about it. I'm a lawyer, but, but we have uh, <laughs> good people on that. Um, but, but I think at the end of the day, I think most studies, you know, buyers do want representation. They want you to get paid. They just want the seller to pay for it. And that's what we encourage and kind of advise is, hey, buyer, you should really see everything. Uh, everything's negotiable. Uh, even a seller who is pretty staunch about, you know, no, I'm not offering and, and I'm not going to pay it. Um, well, when you put an offer in front of them, uh, that might change. You know, how many people have had sellers that, you know, I want 400000 for my house and I'm not taking one nickel less, no matter whatever. Do they end up selling for a little less? You know, I think it's just one of those things where, Part of the, the value and the services that we provide is to try to um, get both buyers and sellers to get out of being human and, and realize that, hey, um, you know, you might have opinions about stuff, but, but you don't do this every day. And, and I do. And sometimes I need to help you get out of your own way <laughs> so that you can sell your house or you can buy a house that's a great house. Um, without getting caught up into emotions and humanity um, because, um, you know, we, that's part of what we do, you know, as part of the services we provide. Well, any other questions? All right. Well, I greatly appreciate you having me. Uh, keep me informed. Again, if you have more questions, that's how I get my material. And uh, obviously, let us know how things are going. Um, you know, if you're having issues with the forms or you need a new form, I'm, I'm the guy. Uh, we look at all requests from any member, uh, and those are taken seriously. Um, so we, we lean on our membership to to help us provide good services for our members. Um, and we're available for you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for your time. All right, well, thank you so much. You guys have a, a great day. Uh, have a good Halloween. And uh, I was gonna say, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron.
This is great. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.